All right, so that last video was kind of a crapshoot, <laughs> basically. Forgot to even talk about sub D much in it, but um, skipped around a little bit. Anyways, so we're going to take a look at the sub D part of that. It's not really that much different for an object like this, but let's say this tabletop instead. Let's create a tabletop real quick. It's not going to be the same size. Let's just say we have a tabletop we're working with. And you can also, uh, when you press G, you can use click. Some guys like that. I don't, I don't personally. Something you could use. Uh, so let's say we had all these corners beveled. We wanted to do a number like this, use a custom fall off. We got the same settings here for that, right? And um, so like, let's say we did do this. All right. Here's the problem is that Shade it smooth, auto smooth, whatever. Eat the normals. We'll have to tweak it still. Back to super ellipse. Super ellipse or super. Ellipse? Okay. All right. So um, let's say we did all this. We had it going. So this is the main benefit of sub D modeling that you won't get with a boolean ingon workflow <laughs> we're supposed to be making this up kind of the same thing but anyways so uh the main problem here is like let's say we were making a film or we were doing a cut scene in a game and for whatever reason we had like an ant right here and we're doing like these marching ants going across this tabletop or something near this area you can see it's faceted right you can't really not not much you can do here with this um a lot of models that you if you create them, even if you're using a Boolean ingon workflow, delete these faces on the top. If you um, create these in a manner that they're very predictable levels here. Uh, for a face like this, you can press Control F and you can grid fill areas, generally speaking. It may not give you perfect topology here. You might want to do something like an inset, potentially, in case it is. I want to press E, S, and then scale it in. You can see when you scale, it does a weird thing like that. You have to scale on, like, say, X only. Kind of correct it. Things like this, right? This will subdivide now, basically. Is what because there's it's symmetrical. It's even numbers all over the place. But even then, you can see sometimes this just doesn't work out too well. You might have to check simple blending, check the spans, do some offsets. And sometimes you can get things to work out again. But sometimes you got to play with the numbers and that can be a little bit annoying right so sometimes it doesn't work out but uh e so we'll scale it in a little bit scale up x again let's try deleting here sometimes doing things like that helps in this case i don't i don't know what numbers we're gonna, we're gonna play around with it for i get it to work it's just like, okay, look, there we go. Got that going. So when we press Control-1, subdivide. Now, subdivision usually loses volume while subdividing. Uh, sometimes the edges don't stay as sharp as you need them to, or you don't have enough supporting geometry to hold the curve the way you want. You might have to bevel them, do all that fun stuff, right? This one, maybe we want to turn... Sub D off in edit mode. It's preferable actually. It helps perform. Maybe see if we could bevel like that. That might be fine, but we can also do Control Shift R, hit E. Uh, do these kinds of little setups as well. It stays a little bit tighter and sharper. Okay. But now if we had marching ants across this table top here, we can see no subdivision. Basically what we had up there. And um, we can turn off optimal display. This will be our actual wireframes now. But when we subdivide, get this, get this, and then we get this. So you can increase your resolution of your. As a result, usually ends up looking nicer. However, depending on the topology here, that's not always the case. You can see it actually looks pretty rough. This corner, so things like machine tools can help alleviate this a little bit, right? You can see that's why I demoed that up there at the top. That also works for Boolean Ingon workflow. 
You do things like that and set flow, of course, you can use throughout this set flow app. Set flow object mode, reselect it. So that will also help alleviate some stress on the faces here. So now that, those ones in the middle might be too tight, whatever the case. So that's a subdivision model base. Uh, also, having a bunch of dead space isn't preferable. Um, generally speaking, you might have to add quite a bit of faces that help helps the, uh, the corners here a little bit. It's kind of weird how that works, like add faces all around. It does actually help topology here when it subdivides a little bit. So I think that can come into play. But now if you ever had marching ants and you had extreme close-up, you can see where you even hit the clipping distance here. Under view clipping distance is at the 0 0.01. He said it's like 0 0.0001, but get that to go away. But it might cause problems if you're looking at things from far away. Just keep that in mind. But we had marching ants now. You can see what's going on. You can potentially see them up close and personal to the extremes. This mesh will be extremely high resolution. But if you're animating this, right? Here's where it gets fun if you are Anyways, uh, if you're animating this, so you have a close-up, and then as you back away, you might not need that much resolution. The um, subdivisions here, you can actually keyframe them, believe it or not. So in the viewport or for the render itself as well. So you need to do both probably. Well, maybe not necessarily both. Um, the viewport, not so much. It's not so important. But the, uh, the render, definitely right so if you were like super close you can have it like this back away oh, sorry you'd have it up higher three or whatever as you back away you can drop it see a change drops then you probably don't want to do it yet do it when it's further away like right there you can barely notice a difference would be better further away you drop it so it's almost like lotting as you animate basically lots levels of detail when you're in game engine you need to create lot models as well so high res to your mesh generally speaking you'll you know depends on the game project but you might use just one lot to like five or six potentially generally it comes in around three i think is kind of average three or four maybe but depending on the project Times I've made things that log to one time and then call completely out of the scene, so it did disappear. So that's the main advantage of subdivision. Not to mention um, when you unwrap these, right? Mark some seams. You start unwrapping this mesh. You do this number. I'm not going to go through all of unwrapping, but you'll notice that that edge will always be there, up res or down res. So if you're at a higher resolution, just to prove a point, I'm going to apply it. Those are the seams. And then this gets a little bit better. I'm going to undo. But when you do unwrap this at some point, although this won't unwrap correctly because of the whole thing. Actually, do the whole thing. Not that much left. That's really not where you want to put the seams in. But See, I got this all, all messed up right now. That one, this one. That should mirror it seems. Mesh machine is great for that. But um, unwrap. You can see, unwrap. We have different unwrap methods. We have conformal, conformal, and we have uh, angular base. Angular base is better for organic hard surfaces. Generally speaking, this could have been unwrapped way better. So. But we can give these some margins just so we can see our islands. Something I want to point out here, though, is you can use subdivision surface as well. So um, you have the subdivision surface applied. You can use that to influence your subdivision. It also needs to be first, apparently, so we have to put it above that weighted. You don't really need weighted normals, generally speaking, when you're using high-resolution mesh because the geometry itself will actually shade correctly. Generally how it works might still use it but and so uh, when you unwrap 
and use that subdivision surface. It's going to take longer to use this, but it basically it's acting like a pre-smooth in this case for the UVs. And that works out pretty well. The thing is, is that if you look under your modifier, you have UV smooth types, you have keep boundaries. I find that keep corners, junctions, and concaves works well, generally speaking. But there's other things in here you can play with as well. And uh, you do want to take those kinds of things into consideration. And also keep in mind triangulation matters as well. So anytime you're going to Substance Painter or Unreal Engine, usually you want to triangulate at the end. You want to keep your normals. And um, shortest diagonal works pretty well. Speaking, I haven't had too many problems with that. But you can try other methods as well. But once you use one of those, you're always going to have to use those, basically. So like if you took this and, un and went and baked it onto a low poly model, uh, substance or baked it here in Blender even. Just remember when you bake a high poly to a low poly, it's low poly's geometry combined with the high poly's geometry and the triangulation of the mesh gets recorded into the normal map, generally speaking, usually how it works. So as a result, if you were to change the triangulation later on, your model will actually look sometimes faceted. It can have little shading errors and things like that. Um, so Keep that in mind when you take everything over to a game engine, Unity or Unreal or CryEngine or whatever, that will still be the case. So you need to make sure that triangulated model game engine. Okay. And it should work out just fine anyway as a triangulated model because most game engines like that. That's the way it is. So, um, but that's the main benefit of sub D workflow. Um, is that you can up res, down res. And so if you needed to have a super fine mesh and you needed to create LODs for it and all that other fun stuff. A lot of times what you'll find is that you can apply the subdivision um, at whatever you want its max to be. Um, the original mesh is still good to go, still high poly or high res or whatever the case may be. But you might come in and just start doing some crazy manual optimization. Now this doesn't always work out as simple and as straightforward as you think it might. Uh, it can skew UVs, it can cause problems, but on simple meshes it's not really that bad. A more complicated stuff you have to be really careful you're going to break everything down manually and do this it may not always be the best thing uh, matter of fact it's better to build a mid poly and then um, create the high poly off of that and then create the low poly off so a mid poly is something like in the middle where uh, basically the mid poly is going to be um, enough density at least at minimum maybe a little bit more where it's able to hold the volume of the shape. All right, it needs to hold the volume of the shape because when you subdivide, you might not do it much on this one because it's already pretty dense. Shade it smooth even. Make sure you shade smooth with a uh, subdivision that gives you GB. But don't use auto smooth on. Uh, but you see how like it changes shape a lot here because it's losing volume. Okay, if I do it again, it just it's smoothing it but it's not really losing volume much. So maybe like a level two here. Maybe even like one. All right, yeah. So level two would be, be ideal, but level one would be possibly usable. Level two, kind of what we had, a little bit less. This might be the same, actually. But anyways, this is more or less an ideal situation. You don't have to necessarily optimize it right away. This is how you would create your low poly. You're going to cut back all the sections that you don't need. So when I showed the sub D workflow video, uh, when you're working iteratively, if you watch throughout that video, the basic block out shape, the first subdivision, the first iteration, that's that's kind of like your primary shapes. Your second iteration is your secondary shapes. When you get to the third and fourth iteration, those should be your high poly models for the most part because you're supposed to basically create your primary and secondaries with those first two iterations. Then you'll have a much easier time bringing those back down to a game model as opposed to um, doing the one with all the extra details on top of it, the third and fourth subdivisions. So, just depends on the shape and how complex it is. But generally speaking, it, it kind of starts to play and balance out fairly well after a little while. So just keep that in mind. And um, yeah, so that's it for this one, guys. I just wanted to talk about that a little bit because it's, it's pretty important stuff. I mean, it's not 
see it everywhere online. But sub D workflow is great just for organics, you know. Use it for that. A lot of times that's really what it's best for. But um if you are gonna do anything hard surface with it, you know, just keep in mind there's there's some things to consider here, right? When it comes to UV maps and holding corners and stuff for the UV whether you want to up res or down res. So if you can make a mid poly that you can UV map and throw textures on and bake potentially with a high poly version, awesome. Down res it and lot it out. So if you have any shading errors, because you got to remember the triangulation of the mid poly would be in the normal map. So as you zoom out, any kind of mismatch between the triangulation of a lot model and that mid poly zoom out becomes lower and lower poly, right? It won't be as noticeable. That's the, generally the idea there. You probably want to work it down a little bit lower than the mid poly though first. Uh, but that, yeah, that's just the idea of this video. I just needed to touch on that real quick because you could do that to something like a desk if you really want. I, I don't think it's really required for a lot of objects and games. You need to have some kind of like scope limitation, meaning like you're not going to have a close-up where ants are marching across it. You don't need a model all that because that's just a waste of time. You can see this thing was pretty fast. I know we did it with a bunch of explanation and stuff in an hour. But something like this will take you like 20 minutes usually, maybe, with UV map. Pushing it, I guess. Or less, maybe. I don't know. Depends on how fast you work. Still had some things to do, like maybe create rollers on the side or something. Like an interactable object. But Anyways, that's it for this video, guys. Hope you enjoyed these last two videos and uh, I'll check you guys out in the next one. All right. I'll take care.